All right, everybody. Well, I appreciate you joining us on a Thursday instead of a Tuesday. Um, we're broadcasting from Salmon, Idaho, at about 5,000 feet here today. Sunny, beautiful elk and, elk and deer. And um, we have an uh, invited guest today, Dr. Jonathan Russell, who's an associate professor of otolaryngology, <coughs> excuse me, at John Hopkins University in uh, Philadelphia. And uh, John is a uh, pioneer in um, thyroid surgery, and he's going to give us a uh, update as to what's going on with respect to thyroid surgery um, in 2020. So, John, thank you very much for joining, and uh, please feel free to um, take over. Perfect. Thanks, Dr. Wagner. Um, everybody. Nice to meet you all. I'm John Russell. I'm a head and neck surgeon at Johns Hopkins Hospital. Um, please, if you have questions as we're going through, just stop me, interrupt me. Um, but what, one, of the, one of the cool things that, that we get to do at Johns Hopkins is really kind of develop a lot of new techniques and technologies and ideas. And, and it's been really fun. I, I have a lot of passion for thyroid and parathyroid surgery. And, and so I'm going to talk to you about some of the new things that are happening and hopefully can encourage you, if you do thyroid surgery at all, to encourage you to at least consider some of these, these new things that are in the pipeline. Um, let me see. There we go. I am a consultant for Baxter Scientific. Um, I think there's different ways to think about tackling any sort of problem. When, and for me, as I'm, as I'm trying to make the world a better place, I'm thinking specifically about thyroid problems. And I think some people say, well, let's, let's make a light year jump and let's kind of give a medication that fixes all thyroid pathology and, and you're done. And I think my personal approach to innovation with thyroid pathology is finding kind of soft spots within the, as we, as we start to move forward and say, okay, if this is where I want to be, what is the next step that we can do? What's the problem that we can innovate on? And how can we move the needle just a little bit to make things better for our patients? Um, in order to do that, I, and I think this is pretty much true for just about any innovation that you do, you have to make sure that the innovation is safe. And when we're talking about thyroid pathology, we have to make sure that it is oncologically sound. Just meaning if I'm treating patients and the surgery goes really well, but I'm leaving cancer behind, then clearly that's not going to be a very viable long-term treatment. And so if I'm doing some sort of intervention, it has to be, has to, can't be worse than the standard of care. And it has to add some discrete or objective value. Patients have to perceive that there's something that they are getting better from the innovation that we're doing. And finally, if we really want this, this innovation to be adopted, it shouldn't be too expensive or too challenging to learn how to do it. So, why my screen is sticking here. There we go. So the first thing, the first thing I wanna talk about is, is kind of the safety and the oncologic validity kind of within each other. And, and the problem with all of this is really this graph right here. In the United States and kind of around the entire world, we know that there's been an explosion in the number of thyroid cancer cases that are diagnosed. And it's now becoming one of the most popular or common cancers, in, at least in North America and in the world. Um, in the United States, it's now the third most common cancer in women. And so as we've seen this huge spike in the number of cases, a lot of people were initially worried that we were going to have more people dying from thyroid cancer. As you all know, on, on this picture, you can see this purple line down on the bottom shows that the mortality from thyroid cancer has been very stable. There is some suggestion that perhaps there has been a very slight increase in thyroid cancer mortality in just the last year or two. But overall, we know that most patients with thyroid cancer are going to have a very excellent prognosis with that cancer. And so it makes it hard to show that we're actually doing anything better or worse with any sort of new treatment that we do. And so one of the things that has been valuable is some of these observation trials that have happened specifically in Japan 
and internationally, South Korea has done some, and even in the United States, we're starting to have some as well, where patients with small thyroid cancers are observed instead of operated on. And so, for example, if you are a young person with a nine millimeter thyroid cancer in, and it's completely surrounded by normal thyroid parenchyma, it may be appropriate to not do surgery right away and instead just follow up these patients with serial ultrasound. Um, this, is, this is kind of was best demonstrated in those Japanese studies, the, the longest of which after 22 years of follow-up and more than a thousand patients, what they found and suggested was that only about 10% of those patients will ultimately go on to need some sort of surgery. And those are patients where you have a, a certain percentage in growth of the, of the cancer or regional metastasis. I think to me, that was first of all, pretty impressive that the numbers were so low. And second of all, what they found that was the most meaningful to me as a surgeon was that the number of patients who had either hypoparathyroidism or a permanent injury to the recurrent laryngeal nerve was actually much lower than the patients who had upfront surgery. Meaning that if you go in to see your doctor with the, with the, the appropriate small size microcarcinoma and you choose not to get surgery, the odds of you having a good outcome are actually higher than if you go to surgery right away. And that kind of certainly caught my eye as something that was very relevant because of course our goal for our patients is to, is to do no harm and to help them as much as we possibly can. Now, there are a number of, of reasons that we should be at least somewhat skeptical of these results in our own populations. Around the world, of course, it's harder to ensure that your patients are going to have adequate follow-up, meaning will they be go, able to go see an endocrinologist every six to 12 months? Will they be able to get an ultrasound every six to 12 months? When the time comes that they need surgery, will, will there be adequate infrastructure to be able to make that happen? You know, those are, those are questions that sometimes maybe Japan is one of the better situated countries around the world to ask that especially because we know that obesity is associated with rapid growth in thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer. And so for that reason, it's not necessarily true that all patients should have observation and it really requires a very, very strong team in order to make that happen. However, just the fact that you can do observation with very good outcomes is meaningful and suggests to all of us that potentially we need to be minimizing the morbidity of every single treatment that we do. Keep sticking. I'm sorry, there we go. So another thing that has come along to try and help us and guide us as we're, as we're doing less intervention and only trying, I mean, really s stepping back even one step further, we know that 80% of people in North America will have a thyroid nodule. And clearly, we don't want to do 80, a surgery on 80% of, of people in North America. And so we have to be very judicious about when we operate and when we intervene. One of the things that was originally designed and, and thought that it will help, and I do think it will help even more in the future, is an additional biopsy looking at either the RNA or the DNA of the nodule in question. And we know that by doing the, checking these molecular markers for signs of malignancy, Usually we can see whether or not there, there are mutations that are associated with a thyroid cancer. And if there are none of those mutations, we generally feel that it's, it's safe to observe instead of doing surgery. Now really the question that we have and what's really going to turn the page going forward is the question of whether or not these are just diagnostic tools or if they can also prognosticate, meaning Yes, we can diagnose if something is a cancer with a relatively high rate of, 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 of relatively high positive predictive value or negative predictive value. But can we say that these cancers are going to be slow growing cancers with an excellent prognosis? Or can we say this cancer will never grow and never spread? Or are we not going to be able to get that sort of information from these tests? Our group and others are really working to try and understand those questions right now. How much is the value? For the time being, however, 
it's really important to remember that these tests are incredibly expensive. They might not even be available in your part of the world. In North America, you make way more money, or meaning the company makes way more money doing these tests than the surgeon or the hospital will ever see doing the surgery. And so it's a little bit funny that way, especially when most of these patients will ultimately go on to use surgery anyways. So certainly you have to be thoughtful when you're using these tests, but in the future going forward, I expect that these molecular markers are going to get better and better at predicting what direction some of these nodules will go. And by the same token, there's even, even cooler things, I think, going on with ultrasound. There's artificial intelligence projects going on around the world looking at nodules and trying to use the, the characteristics, the sonographic characteristics of these nodules to predict which ones are going to be malignant. And, when you, and, and for those of us that do a lot of our own thyroid ultrasound, maybe this is harder to get to a high level. But for family care doctors in, in the middle of nowhere who don't see a lot of thyroid pathology, having an algorithm like that could be invaluable to triage which nodules need to have a biopsy and really kind of help us as we're trying to preserve resources. Um, in, in that same vein, um, let's see here. I mean, in that same vein, I, I think all, all of these machine learning algorithms that are going to come down the pipeline in the future are going to be very helpful. This is kind of just a funny little algorithm on the side, but, but kind of it, it gets to the point that as we're managing thyroid pathology and mo a lot of the pathology that we do, it's most of what we do is very formulaic. If X, then Y. If Y, then Z. And as we start to use these algorithms, we can, you know, you know, one place that we used an algorithm was to find out whether or not we can predict which patients need to have imaging when they have benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. And this is just one example about how asking a few questions using some machine learning, you can get to a point where you can really find out who needs to be using resources, who needs to be having thyroid care, who needs to be doing what, and who you can safely say, just come back in a couple of years for an ultrasound. Now, one other thing that I think is really important to remember before we keep digging on is, is that small advances are very valuable. And one of the greatest advances that we've had as far as patient safety and patient outcomes is remembering that we should be doing less surgery when we're treating thyroid pathology. If we can ever get away with doing a lobectomy, our patients are probably going to be better off. So if you've got a microcarcinoma that's less than one or one and a half centimeters, you probably should be only offering an isolated thyroid lobectomy in most cases. And even for cancers up to four centimeters, a lobectomy may be appropriate, although you have to consider the pros and cons in those patient situations. So I think, you know, doing less surgery and remembering what, we're, what our objective is, is invaluable. And this, this is why, this is a study from, from New Orleans that looked at how common complications are following thyroid surgery. And on the right-hand side, you can see the complications if you do a total thyroidectomy. And on the left-hand side, you can see the complications if you do a lobectomy or a hemithyroidectomy. And what you can see is that if you're a low-volume thyroid surgeon, meaning that you're this blue box right here, and you do a total thyroidectomy, almost one out of four times you're going to have a complication. And it might just be a small complication like a seroma or a hematoma or something like that, um, but it might be something more significant. Whereas if you're a high volume surgeon, your complication rate is just over half of that same thing. I think even more meaningful to me is that you can see that if we're doing less surgery, if we're only doing a lobectomy, our rate of complication goes even lower. And so I think being thoughtful about how much surgery we do and when we do it and what the expected benefit is for our patients certainly is advantageous. And certainly remembering that trying to obtain centers of excellence where people are focused on doing lots of thyroid surgery, lots of ear surgery, you know, trying to really specialize to some degree in what we do, there are advantages that lead to better outcomes for our patients. So I think that that's important as well. Um, another thing that, that we're trying to do for patient safety is use some of the other cool technology that's coming down the pipe. Um, 
parathyroid autofluorescence. The interesting thing about parathyroid glands, of course, they are one of the most at-risk structures when we're doing thyroid surgery. And we know that you know, up to 20 or 30% of patients can have some temporary hypoparathyroidism and hypocalcemia after a total thyroidectomy. And in some parts of the world, that's the entire reason to avoid doing a total thyroidectomy as much as you can. But parathyroid glands have intrinsic autofluorescent properties, meaning that they will light up if you shine the correct wavelength of light onto them. And so Flowbeam is just one example of a, of a novel instrument that you can use to make parathyroid glands more visible. Um, I, I use Flowbeam on a, on a somewhat intermittent basis, and my partner uses it regularly, but we actually have some some recent funding to explore a new product that's actually a handheld product that I'm kind of excited about. So that, that will be interesting to, to show us just how valuable we can move the technology based on the intrinsic properties of parathyroid glands themselves. So kind of what, what I do more than any of those things, however, is I focus a lot on remote access thyroid surgery. And of course, you can make jokes about thyroid surgery all the time about, you know, you can take the thyroid out through the, through the belly button, you can take the thyroid out through the, the rectum is what Dr. Shah always jokes about. You can take the thyroid out through anywhere. Um, I like to do transoral thyroid surgery, and I'm going to go into a little bit of detail about why. And again, it goes back to this idea of incremental advances that, you know, maybe I'm not stopping everybody in the world from getting a thyroid surgery, but hopefully what I do can be a little bit safer and have a little bit better of an outcome for these patients. This is just a diagram that I actually got from a friend in South Korea, Dr. Kim, um, comparing all of the different approaches that have been done to avoid a scar in the middle of the neck. And the reason for that is that most of the patients that come in with thyroid pathology in North America actually are young women who are not very excited about having a scar right in the middle of their neck. And so you, you can see just the number of different things that have been done, either minimizing the cervical incision, um, Dr. Mickley and some others have innovated with some, even using endoscopes to make a very small incision and still be able to take the thyroid out. And then extra cervical approaches, which we also co call remote access. And sometimes people confuse these and they'll call them minimally invasive. Um, we don't generally refer to them as minimally invasive approaches to the thyroid because you, they're actually slightly more invasive because you have to tunnel to the thyroid. And you can see that you can do the transaxillary approach, you can do the BABA technique, you can do the retrofacial approach. And here at Hopkins, we've kind of tried all of these at some point along the way and have never really fallen in love with any of them. And I think that's what most people have felt as they've gone through looking at thyroid pathology. But then there was a very interesting case report that was published by Angun Anyuang in Thailand, um, just about the time that I was finishing up my training, where he reported uh, that he was able to take out thyroid and parathyroid glands through a small incision in the lower lip. And he reported his numbers in a single author series, and his numbers were actually pretty impressive. You can see right here that his Operative times were quite reasonable. Um, sorry, I'll go back one more step. His operative times were reasonable. He had no permanent hypoparathyroid patients. He had no permanent recurrent laryngeal nerve injury patients. And it certainly piqued my curiosity. And within just a couple of months of him publishing this paper, I was able to go over and spend some time with him in Thailand learning this technique. And when I went over there, my original thinking was, oh, this is probably just a it's probably just a, a flash in the pan. It's probably just a, a marketing gimmick that people will do. And within watching one surgery, I was convinced that this is a very good way to do thyroid surgery. And we'll go into this just a little bit, and I'll show you some pictures and some videos that, that we've made kind of as we've gone along doing this technique. Um, at Johns Hopkins, at this point, we, we have done more than We've done more than 300, almost 350 of these scarless thyroid surgeries. This is, this is from a publication that, we're, that we're, is in the process of being reviewed right now, kind of looking at our experience so far and the cases that we've, we've taken care of. 
um, comparing our open surgeries to our laparoscopic surgeries over the last few years. And what you can see is that the size of the nodules that we're taking care of are very similar. And in fact, the scarless thyroid nodules are actually bigger than the, than the open thyroid nodules. They're three centimeters if we're doing it for, for scarless surgery and 2.3 centimeters if we're doing it for open. And, and, you can see our, and you can see we're doing this for Graves' disease. Um, and this is just a few of, of what we've seen so far. Um, major complications are very uncommon. And major complications include conversion, um, include temporary recurrent laryngeal nerve injuries are just very uncommon to have. Um, minor complications are slightly more common and as, you, and as you consider some of those other things. But overall, we have experienced that this is a very safe technique for the right patient who is motivated to avoid a cervical incision. Um, just to let you know, the patients that we've been taking care of so far, we've had a number of them who have had thyroid cancer, in, including a patient with medullary thyroid cancer, although we didn't know that. This is, this is from a, a paper published in the Journal of the American College of Surgeons um, earlier on looking at our complication rate and just highlighting the fact that we, come on computer, there we go. We've not had any permanent recurrent laryngeal nerve injuries and we've had no cases of permanent hypoparathyroidism. Um, this is a, a little bit more dated data, just kind of showing our operative times and our BMIs that go as high as nearly 50 for the BMIs that we're, uh, we're treating. Certainly that's one of the concerns in North America is can we do this scarless thyroid surgery on patients who are overweight? Because a lot more of our patients are overweight. And the answer is a very strong, yes, we can. Um, and so the next question comes, well, okay, if you're doing these cases for thyroid pathology, well, can you, can you make sure if they have a cancer that you can do a good job of getting all of that out? Really, there's three ways that we can measure that. Number one, of course, is mortality, but we don't even talk about mortality from thyroid cancer because it is our expectation that people are going to do well. You can use thyroglobulin measures as a surrogate for either, excuse me, either disease spread or disease recurrence. Um, you can use ultrasound as one of the most popular ones, and you can also use nuclear medicine imaging. We went through and reviewed our results with the patients who had total thyroidectomies. What we found was that there was no significant difference between detectable and undetectable levels of thyroglobulin uh, between the two different groups. And the same goes for ultrasound as well as nuclear medicine imaging, suggesting that at least at this point, even though it's hard to say for sure, it does not seem that there is any oncologic inferiority to the scarless thyroid surgery, which was certainly promising and, and, and made us happy as we were going through. And so if you think that maybe scarless thyroid surgery is just as safe and maybe it's a small advance towards getting patients moving that forward, you, you have to make a justification of why would you try and do it without a scar? What, what's in it for the patient? And so sometimes, you know, patients will minimize or rather doctors generally will minimize the, the impact of a scar. And I think we really have to dig into the literature to understand that having a scar in the middle of the neck for patients with thyroid cancer or thyroid problems actually does matter. Even if the patient doesn't have a keloid and even if it heals pretty well in our mind, um, it might not be healing as well in their mind. And so there, this is a study actually from South Korea where what they found was that having a scar in the middle of your neck affected your quality of life as much as if you had psoriasis, vitiligo, or severe atopic dermatitis. And so ju just having a scar, kind of a binary yes, I have a scar, no, I don't have a scar. If you have a scar, your outcomes are, are worse. Your quality of life is worse. Um, this is another study from North America, uh, a surgeon that does not offer scarless thyroid surgery. And as he went through and he looked at, you know, the number of what is the number one problem that people have after thyroid surgery, nearly 80% of patients say that the worst thing about their thyroid surgery was the concern about the way that the scar looked. I think that's just a shockingly high number, especially when we try to minimize the impact of a scar. Um, we, we wanted to dig into this even a little bit more. And so we asked 
about 200 people to look at pictures of patients who had a scar in their neck and pictures of people who did not have a scar in their neck. And what we found was that if you have a scar in your neck, other people looking at you will assume that you have a lower quality of life. They will also find you to be less attractive. And so when these people look at pictures of people with scars in their neck, they say, well, yeah, I would pay $10,000 to avoid having a scar in my neck. And I don't know that the amount is, is terribly important, but just the fact that having a scar is something that people put value on avoiding. People want to avoid having that incision in the middle of their neck. And that implies that, you know, maybe there is something that we should be looking into. I think even more important for me, and, and I think this one, I, this is one of my favorite studies that we've done, was we wanted to see what do people focus on if you have a scar? When you're talking to somebody, you want to be talking right here and have them looking at you in the, in the eyes. And that's when you feel like you're communicating. And sometimes when you're talking to somebody, their eyes might drop down and start to look somewhere else and you feel distracted, right? You want them to look up and you want them to stay focused on your face so that you know that they're listening to you and paying attention. And so what we did was we actually tracked the pupils of different people sitting in front of a computer screen as we showed them pictures of a thyroid nod or of a thyroid scar. And as we showed these pictures, what we were able to find was that the presence of a scar in the neck distracts your eyes. You can see here a heat map generated of where the eyes focus. And the patient on the left did not have any scar in her neck. And the patient on the right, because she has a scar on her neck, patients or, or not patients, but other people looking at a computer screen and a picture of her focus on her neck. And our hypothesis is that that focus might distract from attention that you would like to be focused on your face. We moved forward with a follow-up study of that one. And on the far left, you can see that that patient had a thyroid scar that actually healed pretty well. It's a pretty well-healed scar. But even the presence of that well-healed scar drew the eye down to her neck. The patient in the middle actually had scarless thyroid surgery. And you can see how people just focus on the middle of her face. The eye is not drawn down to her neck. She is able to communicate by, with people staring at her in the face. My favorite picture on, is the picture on the far right. This woman did not have any thyroid surgery or any surgery at all, but you can see she has a very small mole kind of right here about a little bit lower than where a thyroid scar would be. And you can see that because she has that mole, it draws the attention away from her central triangle. And so we kind of hypothesize that anything that you have in this area of your body is going to detract from attention in the middle of the face, which is where, where hopefully you want people to be paying attention as you're talking to them and communicating. Um, so that's great, but if it's too expensive, then it's just ridiculous for us to be talking about. And the interesting thing was that we found out, at least at Johns Hopkins, the equipment costs that we're paying between the two are very similar. The amount that we bill for, for this surgery is also fairly similar between open surgery and laparoscopic or endoscopic surgery. With the primary difference being driven by how long the surgery takes because OR time is very expensive. And as our OR time gets shorter and shorter, you can see that the cost also gets shorter. This is Another diagram of why I think scarless thyroid surgery through the transoral approach is actually a good idea because you can learn it pretty quickly. After about 10 or 11 cases, you've already overcome most of the learning curve and our learning curve continues to go down the more cases that we do. We compared it to the facelift approach. We compared it to the robotic approach. And what we found was that those all seemed to take a little bit longer and did not have as good of outcomes. Um, when we're talking about cancer in thyroids, I, I do just want to highlight that you have to be very careful before you say yes to patients who have thyroid cancer. Uh, I, didn't know, I didn't do a thyroid cancer case until I had done almost 40 of these transoral cases. And the first one that I said yes to where I knew she had cancer was almost 60 cases in. And now it's about a third of my overall scarless thyroid volume is cancer. Um, but we only treat much smaller cancers. And these are the cancers where we're talking about should be 
are these patients eligible for observation, but maybe they don't want observation or they're not a good candidate for observation, those patients may be good candidates for scarless thyroid surgery. Um, another thing to remember is that if only a few patients can have thyroid surgery through without a scar, maybe it's not worth your time to learn how to do it. The interesting thing with this transoral approach is that almost all patients are candidates for it. If you have a benign thyroid nodule, as long as your lobe is less than 10 centimeters and the nodule is less than six centimeters, you're a candidate for this surgery. Um, you can also use it for parathyroid surgery. You can use it for thyroglossal duct cysts and indeterminate nodules as well, as long as you're paying attention this, and, and being thoughtful. This is a, a, another study that we published looking at what percentage of the overall patients that walk into our office with a thyroid problem, what percentage of those patients are eligible for thyroid or for scarless thyroid surgery. And across three different institutions, we found that a very high percentage, more than 50% of patients are eligible for a scarless thyroid surgery. And so it's not just a niche procedure, but very realistically, we could do 100,000 of these each year in the United States if we could train the, the surgeons to be able to do it. And that's all well and good, but as we talk about making advances, you know, I, I think that these are some of the small advances that we can make in thyroid care that maybe help patients to be a little bit more satisfied with their outcome as they're going forward. But I think as surgeons, we really have a different objective of where we want to go. And we want to be doing everything that we can to improve the overall quality of our life. I, I think kind of, and this is kind of said as a joke, but it's kind of true that our, our model of who we want to be is the surgeon from the, the TV show, Star Trek. Uh, this of course, his name was Bones back then. And, and it was a show where you never saw the ship surgeon. He would never use a scalpel to cut his patients to fix them. Instead, he would always wave a wand over the top of them. And by waving his wand, he would fix whatever was broken inside of them. And I think as surgeons, sometimes we are married to this idea that we have to use a scalpel. We have to cut our patients in order to cure them. And I think really we need to have a change in our, in our point of view so that we're instead thinking about, okay, as the surgeon, I am the interventionalist. And so any intervention that has to happen, whether it be with a wand or with a scalpel, I should be the one doing it because I understand the anatomy better than, than anybody else because I do thyroid surgery so frequently. And so I, I think one of the exciting things that I have seen coming down the line is radiofrequency ablation of thyroid nodules. Um, this is a, a technique that uses alternating radiofrequency currents to create energy inside of thyroid nodules, which can then destroy the tissue locally and cause thermal damage to adja adjacent tissue as well. Um, it's been done internationally for a couple of decades now with really good outcomes, and it is now starting to migrate into North America. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit of our experience that we've had so far with that. But I think, again, it requires the, the fundamental change in thinking that surgeons are not just the guy with the scalpel or the gal with the scalpel. We are the people who do whatever intervention is necessary for our patients to make sure that they get the outcome they want with as few complications as possible. Um, so let's talk about radiofrequency ablation. This is a slide from my friend Leo Hangel in Brazil and, and talking about some of the, the advantages of radiofrequency ablation. And you can see that study after study starts to add up to the fact that when we do radiofrequency ablation, almost all of the evidence suggests that there is a benefit. This is another compilation of studies from 2013 that found that on a 10-point visual analog scale, the symptoms of patients with benign but symptomatic thyroid nodules improve from almost a four down to about a one and a half, and that the cosmetic burden to these patients decreases from a three and a half down to a one. And so it's a fairly significant impact on the quality of life of patients who have benign thyroid nodules when you start to treat them with radiofrequency ablation. I, th I think 
people will say, okay, then that's a reasonable thing and I can get behind radiofrequency ablation for benign thyroid nodules. But what about some of those small thyroid cancers that you talked about earlier? Should we be offering radiofrequency ablation for th small thyroid cancers? And the answer is yes, maybe we should. Again, as long as we have the correct team set up. If we have a team set up and we, ha and we have a patient who's interested in observation, Perhaps radiofrequency ablation is another alternative that we could intervene and decrease the risk of these patients progressing to need surgery. And certainly that would be one of our hopes, and we actually have some grants that we are working on right this second that are, that are hoping to define uh, whether or not this is a, a valid, uh, valid procedure going forward. Um, this is a, a study that we had cooperated with from China looking at five-year follow-up. And that's certainly, that's one of the problems is just the amount of time that we need to see if there will be recurrences or any, certainly any other morbidity that comes with thyroid cancer, just because of the fact that thyroid cancer grows so slowly. This is a paper that we were, we collaborated with and after five years of follow-up, we found that there was no significant difference in the overall recurrence rates or, or persistence rates of the patients who had surgery versus radiofrequency ablation. And complication rates were very similar as well. Um, and so I, th I think kind of as we're moving forward into the future and thinking about the, the ultimate long-term goals, we ultimately want to get to a point where we're only treating nodules that are symptomatic or will eventually cause morbidity or mortality. And so by doing some of the molecular markers, doing some of the you know, choosing wisely who we should operate on, we can start to make benefit, make steps in the, in the correct direction to help our patients. And, and our second goal is to really heal as many patients as we can with no complications, no scar, and hopefully no pain. And if we can do that with the, while keeping the cost low or even lowering the cost and do it for as many people as possible, well, those are, those are extra credit as we're looking forward. And I think some of the things that we can do um, is just really remember that we are the leaders as the surgeons treating this pathology. We have to step forward and embrace new techniques and new technology. We have to be the people that are at the forefront of adopting these and learning what the risks and benefits are. If, if the only thing that I have to offer my patients is surgery, then probably I will not like any of these new techniques. However, if the only thing that, if I have all of these options available, then I probably will find some patients who are candidates and appropriate for this. And so I think moving forward, learning about these new technologies, really finding ways to subdivide our practices and, and be really excellent at the things that we do is really how we're going to move forward. Um, in, the same, in the same vein, I think one of the important things to remember is that sometimes it's not the things that we don't know that, that stop us. Instead, it's the things that we think that we know that aren't true. And so certainly keeping an open mind with these things is invaluable. Um, uh, with that, Dr. Wagner, um, if there's any questions, I'm... Uh... Jonathan, thank you very much for a very interesting approach to uh, an update on thyroid surgery. Um, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to do so. And I think what I'd like to do is, I'd like to say that that study from Japan is quite interesting in that of the 1,200 people that they had, 8% only grew and 4% metastasized out of 1,200 people. That is enormous. And it kind of brings back the concept of acoustic neuromas in, um, you know, otologic or neurotology because Originally, 30, 30 years ago, you got a tumor, no matter what size, we take it out. Now, there's the concept of watching, waiting, repeat MRIs, is it changing in size, so forth and so on. It's a little more difficult to try to harvest RNA and DNA from acoustic neuromas than it is from um, thyroid nodules. So um, maybe somebody's thinking about that concept as well in the near future. But you know, um, stereotactic surgery has, you know, definitely changed the, the, uh, um, the way, you know, uh, surgery is, uh, and treatment has been for acoustic neuromas. Uh, let me just ask you a question. You never mentioned anything about anaplastic thyroid cancer. Um, 
has anything changed in the last 20, 25 years with anaplastic thyroid cancer? Oh yeah, your, your buddy Mark Seferio is doing a lot of stuff with his group down at MD Anderson with this. So the fun thing, the fun thing with anaplastic thyroid cancer is that this used to be just a, you know, it was a death sentence and it was just the diagnosis of anaplastic thyroid cancer, you were done. Um, fascinatingly, in just the last couple of years, we have found an association with BRAF. And if you have a BRAF mutation, that you respond exquisitely well to some of the new medications, the new antithyroid chemotherapies that we have, the tyrosine kinase inhibitors and, and others of these drugs that we really use, lumbatinib among others, that really are highly effective in that subclass of patients with anaplastic thyroid cancer who have a BRAF mutation. And you know, it really changes our perception about, about who, who gets treatment, how much treatment, you know, really, really is adding months, if not years, to the longevity of these patients with anaplastic thyroid cancer. So what's a, what's a five-year survival with somebody who has this mutation, the BRAF? Yeah, so we don't, the, the answer is we don't even know because these patients used to, it used to be 99% more mortality within a year, right? And now we have found this out a year or two ago, and we've got, you know, of those patients, we've got half of them that are still alive. That's and amazing so, because I recall from my head, I had extensive head and neck experience in my training and, and in practice. And I had probably three patients in my, that I had anaplastic thyroid cancer, not a single one lived beyond three or four months. Right. That was it. I mean, it's, it's by far the most aggressive tumor I've ever seen. You know, it makes pancreatic, it makes melanoma look like, you know, kindergarten. Yeah. yeah. And, well, and that's why it's so fantastic that maybe there's some hope What's with, with some drugs. What about the non the non mutation uh, on a on a on a you know somebody who doesn't have that mutation? What's the five year survival with in, in the current day? It's still poor. Incredibly poor. Yeah. yeah. Really, really not a lot of advances if you don't have that mutation. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. Well, great. Uh, anybody have any questions? Uh, anybody have any questions? Agata, you have any questions out there from? I got us from Poland, um, Azi from Somaliland, and usually um, we have some questions from uh, from our friends in, in in Ukraine, Oscar. So, if anybody has any questions, even Terry, Terry, you have any questions from Paraguay? Oh, thank you for the presentation. I actually have one question and maybe missed something during your answer for uh, Richard's question about anaplastic carcinoma. Uh, and how, how many patients uh, have, have had this mutation, at, at least the percentage? Is it like maybe 20% or? It's, you, it's usually more than 20%. It's, uh, it's, we don't, we don't have, rock solid data from Hopkins yet, but anecdotally, I would tell you it's about 50% of our patients have this mutation. Mm -hmm. and, and will you do the tracheotomy uh, on this patient? Because in Ukraine, it's usually the, the head and neck people, they will do the tracheotomy, but maybe it's not very helpful. But so the tr Richard, I don't know about you, but my training was always you should never do a tracheotomy on an anaplastic thyroid patient because you're just making the rest of their life worse. Most and of the time there's invasion of the trachea because this tumor is so aggressive. And the thing is this, unless the patient's airway is compromised because of tumor growth, I mean, you could always do a debulking through a laser procedure to try to improve the airway. But, you know, until they're, until they're at end stage and, and having respiratory difficulty, I wouldn't do a tracheotomy. And yeah, and, and even, even then, if they've got all the respiratory difficulty, then it's kind of just a, all I'm going to do is buy you a week or two, but you're going to have a trach in, and so your quality of life will be lower. It's, it's not worth doing. However, now if you have these mutations, now we're starting to say, and, and you know, Mark Zafario says he trachs all of his patients with anaplastic thyroid cancer. He and I talked about it just a week or two ago. That's um, and so... I still haven't gotten there yet. I'm, I'm not convinced it's the right thing for everybody. But yeah, tracheostomy is appropriate for some patients, maybe. Um, at least if you ask Mark, he'll say definitely. 
So maybe it's time to go to MD Anderson and for a couple of days and see what's going on. And see what Mark's doing down there for sure. Okay, Aziz, Aziz has a question. Aziz, please, uh, please feel free to. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, thank you, Professor, for such an informative lecture, and it was so helpful. Uh, what I want to ask is. Uh, in doing endoscopic translabial approach or scalar cell was something that's totally new to me for tonight. So is it doing for uh, just total cellulectomy or just lobotomy or simple stuff? That's what I am interested in. And we would be happy if we could see some uh, links for some videos of these. Oh yeah, well, hold on. Let yeah. me, if, if we've got a second, I promised that I would share a video with you and I didn't even do it. Here, let me share a video really quick. Uh, thank you, Prof. Yeah, so this is, this is the approach right there through the lower lip. Um, it's laparoscopic and it's, and it's valuable for more than half of the patients that I see at this point. Um, and it's, you know, any small thyroid cancers are great. They're my favorite. It's good for Graves disease. Um, you can see that really you just divide the median rafe and then you find the Delphian node up high. You divide the isthmus right over the top in that pretracheal plane. Um, you can see those nice clean planes that you get a really nice view of. Here you can see us elevating that superior pole and just kind of coming, coming along. You get a great view of your parathyroid gland. I don't think I paused to show you. But you can stimulate your vagus, elevate your thyroid, and as you kind of come along these attachments, you can see how clearly you can see your recurrent laryngeal nerve. Um, you can get really a nice view of that nerve as you kind of protect it and walk along uh, and also get a very sound oncologic resection. Um, you can see just how cleanly you can get everything up from Barry's ligament. Jonathan, is the approach to split the isthmus and, uh, and find the nerve that way? Okay. Yeah, you split, the, you split the isthmus first. I still find the nerve from lateral to medial. I know some people find it from medial to lateral, um, but my preferred is to go lateral to medial but you do find it at the insertion instead of further down like you normally do. Yeah, because you know, I've always been an open neck guy and going from lateral to medial was the way we found the nerve. But you know, if you're gonna split the isthmus, just stay right on the trachea and come down to the nerve. You know, it's the same thing. It probably yeah. saves some time. Thank, thanks for asking. Sorry, I didn't, I meant to show that video as part of the lecture, but you're right, there you go. I like that. I like that. It works pretty well. I mean- Thank you, Prof, I really appreciate it. My, my pleasure. I, I would tell you that if usually I'm training residents, but when I get the chance to do the case totally by myself, it takes me less than an hour. So it's a pretty efficient surgery. It doesn't take a lot of extra time. And there's a and lot of visualization is very good. So a lot less bleeding than with an open procedure. You can, yeah, you get really the magnification you get, you can really control everything as you go down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Anybody else have any other questions? And just just one one more question: uh, Is this technique is is uh, viable uh, viable for uh, lymph uh, node dissection also as well? Yes, Cent central neck dissection it works really well. For lateral neck dissection, usually we'll do like a retrofacial approach or something like that to be able to access all of the nodes. Um, actually, one of the guys in Brazil is kind of Henan. Lena is kind of one of the leaders at that, um, but yeah. Thank you. Yeah, as long as your neck dissection, you don't have, uh, I mean, it's not wrapping the carotid or breaking through the skin. Yeah, yeah. There's limitations to everything. Yep, exactly. Okay, well listen, um, very interesting lecture. It kind of makes me want to do, I'll just share a little. I was in, where was I? In, uh, I was in Fiji. This guy lived on an island, you know, 100 miles outside of, you know, the, the capital Nadi. And he came in with respiratory distress. He's, he had a, he had papillary carcinoma and he had a huge, huge thyroid. So we, na we did a nasal, nasal innovation because you could not control the airway other than him sitting up and doing a nasal innovation. Fortunately, there was an anesthesiologist from the States there at the time, got him innovated and um, basically had to leave an endotracheal tube, okay, 
through, you know, I got to the trachea, I was able to, you know, make a nice incision in the neck, but I had to leave the endotracheal tube in there. Um, Cause there's, that was, that was his only airway. Otherwise he would have died. And the same time I was in Fiji was another time. Um, no, this was in a Marshall Islands, you know, and, the, and it comes back to what you said, Jonathan, about experience. There, your complication rate is based upon your volume of surgery and your confidence as a surgeon. So this lady had a nice hard nodule on the left side and, you know, I, I took it out and the right side felt okay, but, you know, and I didn't have any histology, nothing. Right. Okay, and I felt fairly comfortable with my thyroid surgery. The problem that you have to deal with is if you make a patient hypoparathyroid in a country that has limited resources, you know, where are they gonna get their calcium from? Okay, where are they gonna get right. the thyroid hormone from? And you gotta right. take this in consideration. So anyway, I knew my capabilities. I took her thyroid, I did a total thyroidectomy. It was, she had carcinoma on both sides and she didn't get hypoparathyroid. So she'll well, get- She'll get her thin synthroid, you know, which is, you know, and I was, that was the last time I did thyroid surgery about maybe eight years ago. So. Very good. Anyway, guys, uh, listen, thank you, Jonathan. Thanks everybody for joining. I'll send you guys updates as to the next lecture and um, have a good weekend. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks everybody. Take care. Bye-bye now.